This is the day that God has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning and welcome to Zion United Church of Christ here in Union, Missouri for the first and only Sunday in Christmas, or after Christmas, however it technically works this season, this year. We're still in this season of Christmas, so Merry Christmas, Happy New Year. I'm glad you've shown up and worshiped today. It's exciting that the way that our Christian calendar aligns with the yearly calendar means that we are in Christmas at the beginning and ending of our year. In a way, it helps us reframe our own stories of our year to year, that we begin and end each year during Christmas, during the rebirthing of Christ into this world, into the looking towards the, the expectation of love, hope, peace, and joy being born anew in our world and indeed in all of us. It is this hope that is our beginning and our ending that helps us carry on throughout our year. And so it is my hope, it's my hope for all of you, it's my hope for myself, that it's not just that this time during Christmas um, is worth celebrating the love, hope, peace, and joy of Christ, but that during this Christmas season, I'm able to hold on to it in such a way that it is joy, hope, peace, and love that guide me and indeed guide all of us throughout our year. So on this day, on this first Sunday of the year, on this first day of this year, let us consider how we are going to keep the story of Christmas alive throughout our year, how we will hold on to the hope, love, peace, and joy that has been born once again in this world. It is time to worship God. Please join me in the call to worship. Let all creation praise the name of the Holy One. The limbs of life praise the everlasting God through the markings of time. Let all creations praise the name of the Holy One. The flowers, land, and trees praise the divine gardener through rest and renewal. Let all of creation praise the name of the Holy One. Living creatures praise the Spirit of God through our breathing, living, and being. Praise God. Join me in the gathering prayer. Holy God, we love. You, you make, make us, us a community. community. 
you gather us as your offspring and knit us together with grace and mercy. In your presence there is fullness of love, joy, hope, and peace. Thank you for being among us this day and with us in every moment of our being. Receive our praise, dwell in our midst, and create in us a heart that yearns for you and your, and kingdom. your kingdom. In the, in the name, name of Emmanuel, we pray. we pray. Amen. The first reading of the scripture this morning is taken from Psalm 148. Here, <clears throat> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from heaven. Praise God on the praise God on the heights. Praise God, all of you who are the messengers. Praise God, all of you who comprise the holy forces. Sun and moon, praise God. All of you bright stars, praise God. Your highest heavens, praise God. Do the same, you waters that are above the sky. Let all of these praise the Lord's name because God gave the command and they were created. God set them in place always and forever. God made a law that will not be broken. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters, and all you ocean depths. Do the same, fire and hail, snow and smoke, stormy wind that does what God says. Do the same, you mountains, every single hill, fruit tree, and every single cedar. Do the same, you animals, wild or tame, you creatures that creep along and you birds that fly. Do the same, you kings of the earth and every single person, you princes and every single ruler on earth. Do the same, you young men, young women too, you who are old together with you who are young. Let all of these praise the Lord's name because only God's name is high over all. Only God's majesty is over in heaven. God raised the strength of his people, the praise of all his faithful ones. That's the Israelites, the people who are close to him. Praise the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Please rise in the body or in spirit for the opening hymn 182.
Please be seated. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is good that we go to God in prayer confessing our sins. Would you please join me in the prayer of confession? Eternal God, the dawn of a new year prompts us to reflect on our past and hope for our future. Help us live every day seeking your way and moving on your path. Help us commit to love and resolve to extend the grace and mercy we need from you and our neighbor. Make us new. Amen. The God who counts our days knows us intimately, loves us abundantly, and abides with us relentlessly. Receive the brand new mercies of this day. Hold the love of God closely, firmly, and freely. Transformation, grace, and new life is assured this day. Praise be to God. Amen. There are no special announcements. Uh, we've made it through. Uh, the Advent season, we're into Christmas. It's good. Things will start coming up and shaping up soon. Um, we're, we will be having our installation of new officer. I guess I, I, guess I lied. Whoops, we die have an announcement. We, all, we will be having our installation of new um, officers with our church council um, next week, and we'll also be saying a thanks to um, those who are cycling off um, from church council. But other than that, we're just we're having communion. It's fine. We won't be continuing to do communion by the Little Cups. We just thought it would be a little easier on the first of the year um, to have a few less volunteers um, on this New Year's Day. Um, but other than that... Um, Life is going pretty well. Everything is shaping up, and we're going to be um, looking to get right into the full swing of things this year. And so it's really exciting, um, and yeah, it's a good time to be here. And with that, it is out of the continued generosity of the friends and members of this church that continues to support this congregation financially. We give thanks to all of those who continue to contribute in all of the various ways that you do um, to help the ongoing work and ministry of this church. And it's time that we rise in body or in spirit, giving thanks to God as we bless these gifts. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in singing our doxology. join me in the prayer of dedication. Generous love, bless these offerings. Stir up the gifts within for your glory. Show your provision through the sharing of our resources and empower us to steward our days as precious and holy. Amen. You may be seated. The second reading of scripture comes from the gospel according to Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 23. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. He gathered all the chief priests and legal experts and asked them where the Christ was to be born. They said, In Bethlehem of Judea. For this is what the prophet wrote. You, Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means are you least among the rulers of Judah, because from you will come one who governs, who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the Magi and found out from them the time when the star had first appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search carefully for the child. When you found him, report to me, 
so that I may go and honor him. When they heard the king, they went, and looked. the star they had seen in the east was ahead of them, until it stood over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house and saw the child with Mary, his mother. Falling to their knees, they honored him. Then they opened their treasure chest and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Because they were warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they went back to their own country by another route. When the Magi had departed, an angel from the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod will soon search for the child in order to kill him. Joseph got up and during the night took the child and his mother to Egypt. He stayed there until Herod died. This fulfilled what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, I have called my son out of Egypt. When Herod knew the Magi had fooled him, he grew very angry. He sent soldiers to kill all the children in Bethlehem and in all the surrounding territory who were two years old and younger, according to the time that he had learned from the Magi. This fulfilled the word spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and much grieving, Rachel weeping for her children, and she did not want to be comforted, because they were no more. After King Herod died, an angel from the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. Get up, the angel said. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. Those who were trying to kill the child are dead. Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus ruled over Judea in place of his father Herod, Joseph was afraid to go there. Having been warned in a dream, he went to the area of Galilee. He settled in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken through the prophets might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. Would you please join me in singing Away in the Manger, hymn number 205. Please join me in a spirit of prayer. O God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Nothing says Merry Christmas like the slaughter of the innocents. A week after we celebrated the birth of Jesus, we are given the horrifying reminder that Jesus' birth wasn't only met with justice, peace, and silent nights, 
On this first day of the new year, we are met with a sobering reminder, the more things change, the more things stay the same. The atrocities of Herod and the flight of the Holy Family into Egypt as refugees is a startling reminder during Christmas tide. The world is far from what we hope it to be. It's not a surprise we never read Matthew's gospel on Christmas Eve, or at least not in its fullness. We're caught up with Luke, with his angels, shepherds, innkeepers, and a swaddled Jesus lying in a manger, while Mary and Joseph quietly are looking on. They fill us with awe and wonder. We contemplate their journey, the labor, the stable, making room for Jesus. But whatever we do, we keep the shadow of Herod's legacy far, far away. Matthew's nativity is more of a nightmare. Yes, we are given our magi and a star to guide our imaginations, and we will celebrate the gifts of the Magi and Epiphany next week. But today, Matthew doesn't let us forget. Herod, too, is the reason for the season. There is a threefold reality working in today's reading. The first is the likely historical context of Matthew's audience. The second is Matthew's literary construction of the gospel, positioning Jesus as a new Moses. And the third is Herod, his rule, and his legacy in the region. And like a braid, all three are necessary for recognizing the full strength and power of this story. So we begin with Matthew's audience. Although no one is certain, to the best of biblical scholarship, the consensus is the Gospel of Matthew was written to Messianic Jews living in Antioch, which is in Syria, about five years after the destruction of Jerusalem of 70 of the Common Era. After a series of failed rebellions attempting to throw off the yoke of Roman oppression, the Roman governor of Judea, Vespasian, sends his son, General Titus, to end any thought of independence. Not only does Titus sack the city, but he also utterly destroys the temple. On the exact anniversary of the Babylonian destruction of the first temple, some 500 years before, Titus has the temple priests, scribes, and their families killed, Copies of the Torah and other writings are burned, and sacred objects destroyed, and stone after stone are thrown down. There is no comprehending this destruction. People flee the city. Communities near and far are devastated. Their holy city, the place of so much importance, destroyed. In the aftermath of this destruction, a variety of Jewish communities emerge trying to make meaning, hold themselves together, and offer any bit of hope they can muster. Matthew's community is one such group. Convinced Jesus is the Messiah, this group of Jews is trying to make sense of the world. It makes sense at this time while many other Jewish groups didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. For the promise of the Messiah in the Messianic age was a reign of peace and justice where all pain and suffering and persecution were no more. So what does Matthew do? He offers a seed of hope by planting the story of Jesus firmly in the story of Israel and its covenant. Remember, Matthew's gospel begins with a genealogy that goes back to Abraham, including David, Solomon, and other kings of Israel. By naming the individuals, Matthew's audience would not only connect their story, of, connect the story of Jesus with their own faith and cultural tradition, but also connect Jesus as an heir of this lineage. And after the genealogy, Jesus' father, Joseph, begins having dreams, just like the Joseph of Genesis who worked for Pharaoh in Egypt. Jesus, like Moses, is saved as an infant, crosses back through a body of water, spends time in the wilderness, and more than once finds or dispenses wisdom after spending some time on a mountain. Matthew quotes Hebrew scripture more than any other gospel and is constantly placing Jesus as a continuation of the tradition. So when we read Matthew, and particularly the first two chapters, we are supposed to link this story to the story's prophecy and wisdom of Jewish scripture. For Matthew's audience, there would have been no better modern pharaoh than Herod, which brings us to Herod and his legacy. There is no other ancient source that recalls the edict of Herod to kill every son under the age of two. We might take a breath, a sigh of relief, um, that this might not have actually happened. It takes, it, if it had taken place all over the region, it would have likely been recorded elsewhere. 
But since Herod did know that the child was to be born in Bethlehem, if the order was only sent there, chances are, because of the size of the town at the time, that less than two dozen kids would have died. This doesn't dismiss the tragedy, but it might account for the lack of additional sources confirming the event. But most people agree that this is a storytelling addition. Matthew wants us to think of Herod as Pharaoh during the Exodus story, who does a similar thing. But while it's likely Herod didn't order this precise killing of children, it wasn't outside his character to do so. When Rome conquered the region in 67 BCE, they struggled to control the region. This was until they found Herod, a savvy political ruler. His grandfather was a convert to Judaism, and his father had been loyal to the governor, Pompey. Herod would marry Merimim, who was a descendant of the Hasmonean dynasty. The Hasmoneans had, had, until the Roman takeover, established an independent Jewish state after hundreds of years of foreign occupation. Merimim was also part of the priestly family. And when Herod would appoint her brother to the high priesthood, he kind of helped this unity of both the Roman occupation and the respect and honor of the people. Loyal to Rome and with a wife that the local population adored and respected, Herod was the perfect fit. He began to build up the city. Jerusalem became a location of international travel and pilgrimage. He increased the water supply and completely renovated the temple. And as a result, the local economy boomed. Eventually, he was a little paranoid. He felt threatened. So in addition to building up large fortresses and military presence throughout the region, he would eventually have his brother-in-law drowned. He then had his wife executed a few years later. And when his own sons came of age, he had two of them killed. Herod was known for killing off any political threat, opponent, or simply those who did not abide by his rule. So today's story about the slaughter of the innocents might not have happened, but once again, it wasn't outside of the character of Herod. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the territory of Judea, during the rule of King Herod, Magi came from the east to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the newborn king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east and we've come to honor him. When King Herod heard this, he was troubled, and everyone in Jerusalem was troubled with him. Or as the NRSV states, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. Most of us don't consider King Herod to be part of the Christmas story. I've never seen King Herod in any nativity sets. And yet Herod understands the significance of Christmas better than most of us ever could. He was troubled. He was frightened. And so was all of Jerusalem. Perhaps all of Jerusalem was frightened because they knew exactly what kind of person Herod was. Or maybe they were frightened because they liked things the way they were. It was Herod who had his wife, brother-in-law, and two sons killed. But he was also the one who brought stability and prosperity to the region. And he, it was him who kept it protected within the Roman Empire. As much as we might want to believe that Herod was some monster with horns and fangs, he wasn't. And the Reverend Dr. Matt Skinner says it best. He says, and I quote, Evil rarely presents itself as a beast with horns, fangs, and claws. Usually it dresses itself up in respectability. It burrows into systems that we rely on to keep our societies from spinning into chaos. Evil rarely acts alone. Tyranny and arrogance can't exist in a vacuum. They demand accomplices. They survive because their enablers are also contributors. Consider, for example, who would have killed the children. Herod would have given the order, but he would have not wielded the sword. He had people, agents who would swoop in, pound on doors, and disappear again as quickly as they arrived. How did they benefit from the system that tried to kill the Prince of Peace at almost any cost? Consider, too, the residents of that weary small cow town a few miles from Jerusalem. As each Rachel of Bethlehem left, was left weeping for her children, the rest of the region would perhaps shrug. Parents would hug their kids a little tighter that night. At least Herod was still building roads, ports, and aqueducts. The economy was booming. Was it worth risking all of that by demanding change? just because someone else's children had suffered violence. Herod was a savvy politician who knew how to use favoritism, brutality, deception, and arrogance to advance his ends. Those are the tools used by people who believe they will never be held accountable. 
Those are also the values that get encoded into patterns and norms that govern our daily life. And they become our ethos. They make us complicit. Herod and his resistance to the reign of God remain alive and well today. End quote. When this story is woven together, when you see the braid for what it is, both Matthew's community, the, the story that Matthew is trying to recreate about casting Jesus in the light of a new Moses and also recognizing this historical figure of Herod and his actual legacy of destruction, violence, and evil, what we start to realize is that Christmas is our reminder. God just does, it, Christmas is our reminder. God doesn't just show up in celebration and praise, but to confront the powers of evil. The birth of Jesus is a direct challenge to the powers of evil, control, and death. Christmas is not just a story of the joy of hymns and serenity of silent nights, but the defiant hope that shows up in the thick of evil, trouble, and pain. Herod understands the threat that Jesus presents. He, understand how, he understands how the system works. He understands the only power he wields is based on violence, manipulation, and corruption. Herod knows his reign is threatened, but he also knows that if he goes down, a lot of people are going down with him. And in fact, he's counting on it. Christmas is our reminder that the reign of God is often at odds with the ways of the world. Christmas challenges us to take inventory of our lives and become the change we want to see in the world. Like today's story, the details for our coming year are far from clear. Yet we know some things to be true. This Christmas tide, things are far from perfect. No amount of caroling or cookies has vanquished the pain, grief, and brokenness of the world. It doesn't take long to look around and find something wrong. Opioids killed another 100,000 people this past year. 250,000 people died of COVID. Gun violence went up, and not just homicide, but suicide as well. Long ago, we stopped asking if another mass shooting was going to happen and just began wondering when. Discrimination laws and outright attacks on our LGBTQIA siblings are on the rise. Inflation is often just another name for corporate greed. The sustainability of life on this planet continues to be in peril. Wars and threats of war continue to unravel the global cooperation necessary for life to thrive on this planet. When we imagine the evils of this world and the intoxicating allures of power and control, no one person knows how it all works. The world continues to be an ever-involving, increasingly complicated and complex reality. The world is changing. It always has and always will. And so will we. This new year will be different. Sure, there will be a lot of guideposts along the way, people, places, and practices that are familiar, and trends will certainly continue and repeat themselves, but it's not the end of the story. The last chapters, or the chapter of this coming year has not yet been written. This year will be different. Dr. Alexander Shia, a psychotherapist, anthropologist, and theologian by training, has a deeply transformative pilgrimage practice. In addition to so many of his different studies and work, he's often one who leads different pilgrims um, throughout the world. Specifically, he does a lot of pilgrimages across the country of Spain, uh, the Camino. And although he's not alone in, in describing the Christian faith as a journey, he has recognized a particular way in which all of his pilgrimages had led, led him to realize how each of the Gospels are different journeys in themselves. They're all telling the story of Jesus, but they're helping us move through our life. And there is a fourfold cycle. And so in his book, Heart and Mind, The Four Gospel Journey for Radical Transformation, he recognizes that in some ways, each gospel presents a different question, one that helps us move spiritually throughout the story. And so for Matthew, this guiding question that he asks is how do we face change? And so as we follow Matthew's gospel throughout this liturgical year and begin this new calendar year, this question seems perfect. How do we face change? 
How do we as communities face change? How do we as individuals face change? The world is going to continue to change. It's not something that we can necessarily control, but it is something that we can face either bravely and courageously or quite honestly, cowardly and just timidly. And so we bring ourselves to the fullness, saying, what can this year do for us? How can it change us? Can we guide the ship just a little bit more towards hope, love, peace, and joy? When we weave the gospel story with Matthew's audience and we know about Herod and we begin to recognize how powerful the story can be, because it's not simply about Jesus being a new Moses, but a God who shows up in history and mystery and joins humanity in its fullness. It reminds us that God shows up in the mess of life itself. The Herods of the world are deal makers, willing to trade all kinds of things. You give up hope, they will give you self-righteousness. You give up joy, they will give you wealth. You give up love, they will give you power. You give up peace, they will give you security. The Herods of the world will start demanding loyalty when the world is falling apart. They'll change, trade everything. They'll give you anything you want in exchange for your hope, peace, love, and joy. And so it's in this season, it's in this last days of Christmas, that we hold on to the hope, peace, love, and joy of the Incarnation. We hold on to them with everything we have for this coming year, knowing that the story has not been written. So as we continue on in our year, as we have a fresh start to this season of our life, may the hope, love, peace, and joy be with you every step of your way. And may they guide you into this year. And may it be so. Would you please join me in a spirit of prayer? O oh, Holy One, gracious God in whom is heaven, we give you our thanks and praise. We give you thanks and praise for showing up in this world, for showing up in the mess, for showing up in our mess. We can take an inventory of our lives or at the world and know things are far from perfect. We have such bigger hopes. We have so much more love. We desire such a more deep peace and an abounding joy. Be with us this day. Be with us this year. Help our guides, help us move through this world. Help us face change with joy, with love, with hope, with peace. Help show up in our lives in every big and small way. Help us move from this place out into the world knowing that while the evils and the herods of this world will try to offer us a deal, we know that there is so much more we can do to enable your reign to carry on in your way. And so, O oh God, we pray for the world and all who walk and live within it, for creatures large and small. We pray for the countries of this world. We pray that your justice, your peace, your love are the change makers. We pray for communities near and far. We pray for our neighbors, our strangers, and even our enemies. We pray for our loved ones. And we pray for ourselves. And although we don't know where we're always going and what the year might have in store for us, we do know who we're following. And so we pray the prayer Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please join me in our hymn of preparation, number 695, as we gather at your table.
Every Christmas, we gather in this same room to tell the same story of a baby born in a manger. The plot never changes. There are never any surprises or twists. So why do we do it? Why do we keep telling the same story? We tell this story because our spirits need to hear it. Over and over and over again, like water in the desert, we need to be reminded that God has drawn close to this hurting world. We need to be reminded that God just couldn't stay away. This is true on Christmas Eve. This is true on Christmas. This is true today, and it is true at this table. Every time we gather at this table, we tell the same story. A story of a Messiah who gathered his friends together for one last supper. The story of a Messiah who loved us so much he just couldn't stay away. So friends, bring the parts of you that feel like the desert. Bring the parts of you that are aching to hear this story again because this is good news for you. Would you please join me in the affirmation of faith? We believe that for generations, people have gathered together to tell the Christmas story because there is something about this story that speaks to the deepest parts of us. We believe in bundling up this hope, this good news, and passing it on to our children, to our neighbors, to the world around us. I believe my voice can make a difference just like I believe this story can make a difference. So I will not stay quiet. I will tell this story of love that makes room for all. I will sing this story of a love that knows our name. I will live this story because love has come again. I believe the words have power. I will not stay quiet. Amen. And so we remember that on, at the Last Supper, on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus gathered in an upper room with his friends, with his disciples. And after the meal, he took a common loaf of bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and passed it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which has been broken for you. In the same way, after the meal, he took a cup. And after giving thanks to God, he poured it out and passed it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins and the fullness of grace. Every time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. So we pray once more. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Pour out your Spirit on this table, upon this grain and grape, and on our very lives. Strengthen us from the inside out, as we tell your story of good news, weave your story into our. Bless this meal and all of us that we might come to know how deeply you love us. Amen. Through the body, the broken bread, the body of Christ. And this is the time where we can start to unwrap our little lunch boxes. <laughs> the Jesus Lunchables. Take and eat. Through the cup of blessing, we participate in the new life Christ gives. Take and drink. Please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving. O Holy One, your work is always unfolding in and through us. May this meal you prepared this day and always remind us that we belong to you, that we belong to your wondrous story, a story etched into the wrinkles of time, to generations that have come before and will come after to a love that won't let go. Bless us this day and all the days to come. 
Amen. Would you please rise in body or in spirit and join me in our closing hymn, The First Noel, hymn number 229, verses 1, 2, and 3. I know I might not have convinced anybody to add a little King Herod to your nativity scene today, but I hope that you remember that God shows up in our, me- in, in, in our messes, that God continues to show up in this world bringing hope, peace, love, and joy despite what the Herods of the world might do or say. So go this day with God's blessing. Go, knowing that there is nothing you can do Nothing you can say, nothing in the past nor things to come, nor anything else in all of creation that will ever be able to separate you from the love of God which we have come to know in Jesus the Christ. Go in hope, joy, love, and peace this day and always. Amen and amen.